All right, everyone. Uh, I want to, to welcome everyone here. I am beyond excited to have everyone here, hear our speakers. As I looked at the list that Diane sent me, we got a lot of great uh, people that, that are in my life, uh, both clients, my family, all these types of folks, and I am just so excited for uh, everyone to hear the message. Uh, I'm going to keep my, my comments brief because I know you came here to hear Jason and his message and his message, uh, you know, as I was telling him before, more and more people need to hear this. So, um, you know, I'll just give you a little bit of, of Jason's bio if you didn't have a chance to, to see it in the invite. Uh, Jason Redman is a retired U.S. Navy lieutenant. Uh, he spent 11 years as enlisted and uh, 10 years as a SEAL officer. As a former enlisted Navy person, that means a lot. The best officers were, were guys that had come up through the, the enlisted ranks. They called them Mustangs. Um, he was awarded the Bronze Star with Valor, the Purple Heart, the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Navy Commendation Medal, the Joint Service Achievement a Medal, five Navy Achievement Medals, two combat action ribbons and the U.S. Army Ranger tab. So, I mean, <laughs> I think Navy SEALs are, are the superheroes, uh, real life superheroes. So, I mean, I'm so excited once again to, for you guys to hear um, Jason's story. After being se severely wounded in Iraq uh, in 2007, Jace, uh, Jason returned to active duty before retiring in 2013. Um, one of, to build on that, after he retired from the military, he started his own business, and you're going to hear some of the stories about that. And then uh, finally, he is a, a three-time uh, author, uh, a best, best-selling best author of the New York Times. His book's The Trident, um, as Overcome, and uh, Leadership Techniques of America's Toughest Warriors. So without further ado, Jason Redmond. Adam, thanks so much, man. And uh, hey, what is up, everybody? It has just been a crazy time in this world. Um, you know, and I am fortunate enough to be able to live out my new mission. My mission for many years was to be a SEAL. I talk so much about people living their mission. My new mission in this life is to help people be better. And I've obviously had a crazy journey. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about my journey and how those lessons translate to all aspects of life. So what I want to start out with is my book is The Trident, and why did I call it that? And Navy SEALs have gotten all kinds of notoriety in the last several years. We've had a lot of, we've been in the spotlight a lot. And it, it's, it's an interesting time, and I wish we were here in person, because if we were in person, you would see that I'm not that big of a guy. I think people have this idea that Hollywood is kind of painted that the average special operations guy is just, just gigantic, six foot five, muscle bound dude who sits in his house, you know, you know, shaving with a blowtorch and, you know, picking his nails with a Bowie knife, you know, praying for war and combat. And I'll be honest, when I was a kid, I probably believed some of that. But the reality is the average SEAL is really not that big. I'm five seven and about 170 pounds. Uh, the average SEAL is 5'10 and 180 pounds. And uh, it, it's funny because perspective plays such an interesting role in this life. And I want to take you back to the beginning. I want to take you back to this emblem because when I was a young kid, man, I was literally a, a uh, I was 14 years old and literally the underdog, man. I was the 90 pound weakling, um, you know, when I decided at that age, my dad had always told me, you're too small to do this, you're too small to do that. And I don't know what it is. Something finally clicked in my mind in 10th grade. And I told my dad, I said, I'm going to go play football. And he was like, no, you're too small. And I was like, I'm going to do it. Like, they need more people. I'm going to go play. And I was by far the smallest person on the team. But it was about that time that my dad said to me, you know what? You know, you have this mindset of just driving forward. You're interested in special operations. You're interested in things like that. He said, you swim, because I had grown up off and on. My parents were divorced. I lived in the Virgin Islands. And he said, you swim. There's a group of individuals that I trained with in the Army, and they were called Navy SEALs. And he said, you should check them out. And I remember that first time that I found out about the SEALs, and I looked at this emblem. And this emblem is the emblem of the U.S. Navy SEALs. And to date, there's only about 12,000 men who have ever worn this emblem, who have ever made it through SEAL training and earned the right to wear this emblem. 
it's incredibly difficult just to get through the process to be able to even be selected to get to the point that you can wear this emblem. And I remember as that young kid looking at that emblem saying, man, I want to wear that. You know, it just represented everything that I believed in. It represented all this badassery. It represented the highest levels of warrior, you know, the warrior spirit. I was a kid that grew up in the GI Joe generation. So I kind of saw myself, I'm going to become a SEAL and I'm going to be like Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow and these other crazy commandos that I, I believed uh, in as, as a young kid. The, the, the interesting thing is I went down that path I didn't realize as a young kid that this was kind of romantic view of what warfare is. And it actually kind of led me down the wrong path. And, uh, and I'll talk about that along this journey. So I finally did it though. I entered into the Navy. I scored high enough on my ASFAB scores. I scored physically well enough to get to basic underwater demolition seal training. And the picture that you're looking at on there is me, an 18-year-old kid that had just checked into SEAL training. SEAL training is known as BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training. And if you ever meet anybody, you have a greater chance of meeting a fake SEAL than you do a real SEAL. And I always laugh when I meet people because oftentimes they'll say dumb things like, oh, you won't find me in the... In the uh, you won't find me in the SEAL logs. They erased my name because everything I did was classified. That's a lie. <laughs> Everybody who goes through SEAL training, their names are recorded. Now, you may go on to do more classified things later that those missions will be classified. But uh, to go through BUDS, that is not classified. And I remember checking in there thinking, man, this is the beginning of my life. This is where it all happens. Uh, SEAL training is notoriously difficult. Uh, it has an 80% attrition rate, and uh, and that's just to show up. You know, the vast majority of people will quit uh, really within the first couple of weeks of training, and then usually there's a lull, and then it rolls you into the fourth week, and the fourth week of training is called Hell Week. <clears throat> Hell Week is known across the military as probably the toughest block of training in the entire world. Um, it lasts an entire week. And this is a picture of me when I graduated from Hell Week. Um, Hell Week starts on Sunday afternoon, you know, kind of mid-morning, late afternoon. You don't know when it's going to start, but it's like the greatest crucible. And, and it's like the greatest mind game because before you start Hell Week, they really don't know a whole lot about it. You just know that it's going to be incredibly hard, that you will get almost no sleep for that entire week. The average student will get about three hours of sleep the entire week. Frequently, you're carrying this rubber boat around on top of your head with your boat crew. Frequently, you're in the ocean getting surf tortured. Uh, they get you right close to being hypothermic, right on the edge. And then they pull you out and you'll do physical activities until they put you back in the water. And over 80% of the class will quit during Hell Week. Our class started with 148 individuals. By the time we finished Hell Week, we were down to 55. By the time we finished SEAL training, we were down to 19 who actually graduated. So my first introduction to like how hard this was had to do a little bit with false expectations. So I remember getting ready to get ready. I was getting ready for Hell Week and a buddy of mine had graduated already from uh, or had already made it through Hell Week. And I said to him, I said, Brian, hey, man, I'm getting ready to go to Hell Week. Do you have any tips or tricks or shortcuts, anything, anything to help me make it through training? And he was like, yes. He's like, if you can make it to Wednesday morning, it's all downhill that it gets easier after that. And I was like, okay, Wednesday morning. So here I am, this young 18 year old kid and, and I make it through Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. And finally Wednesday morning came along and like the sun was shining and I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm telling my buddies, I'm like, guys, it's all downhill from here. This is where it gets easier. And, uh, and it didn't. <laughs> Thursday night was my absolute toughest night of Hell Week. Temperature dropped in San Diego down to um, the, the mid 40s. My boat crew, which boat crews are ranked by height, the tallest dudes are boat crew one, and the shortest dudes, which I was one of the shorter dudes at five foot seven, we were in the Smurf crew, complete with a little Smurf on the front of your boat. And the Smurf crew was losing every race. 
And every race we lost, we would have to go stand on top of the 10 meter dive platform above the pool, right on the edge of San Diego Bay. And on that night with these low 40 degree temperatures, the wind was howling off the bay. All I was wearing was those little tri shorts in that picture. And I remember standing up there with my arms stretched out and I'm shaking to death. I'm about to just shake out of my, my own skin. And I remember thinking of what Brian said and I said, make it a Wednesday morning and it'll get easier. And I remember thinking, this sucks, I'm gonna quit. And the funny thing, when you go through SEAL training, there is a bell that hangs in the courtyard. And at any point during SEAL training, you can go up and ring that bell and say, I quit, I've had enough. Well, during Hell Week, they actually put the bell on the back of a truck and it follows you around everywhere you go. And I remember standing on top of that plat that dive platform, looking down on the pool deck where the, park the truck had been pulled up right to where we were doing these races. And I was like, man, I'm gonna go down and ring that bell. And I paused and I thought about it. I was like, dude, you ring that bell, it's all over. It's all over. You don't make your dream. You don't achieve what you set out to do. So I had to take a breath and remind myself, why am I here? And I feel like so many people in this life, when they reach these hard moments, when you know they're, at the, they're in the midst of the storm, they're in the midst of the pain, they're in the midst of the misery, they forget their why. And it's so critical in this life to understand that, to figure out who you are, what you stand for, and what your mission in this life is. It's one of the biggest things I talk about because that day, my mission to become a SEAL is what kept me from climbing off that tower and quitting. I managed to endure and I made it to Friday morning and I made it to become an actual Navy SEAL. About a year later in September of 1996, I was awarded my Trident. And uh, what an amazing day. I mean, here I was, this, this young kid, man, I was only 19 years old at this point. And I remember when they punched my trident into my chest, which is a big honor to have your teammates tack it in so that hopefully it stays. And it started this journey, man. I started this journey on being able to do all these amazing things. I was traveling all over the world, uh, learning to dive and jump and jump, you know, dive and jump out of airplanes and blow things up and shoot. And, you know, I was doing counter drug operations in Central and South America and just this incredible career. I remember so many times I thought to myself, I cannot believe that I get paid to do this. But oftentimes as we start to excel, we have to be a little careful. And what was starting to happen is I was starting to walk with a couple of dangerous friends. Those dangerous friends are called ego and arrogance. Still doing well enough though to excel. I uh, had become a uh, instructor in my SEAL team and I taught marksmanship, reconnaissance, communications and survival. And I was still doing well enough that uh, members of my team recommended me for a commissioning program. And in the very early days of 2001, uh, I headed off to Old Dominion NROTC uh, to work on achieving my commission or work on earning my commission. And obviously you guys know what happened on September 11, 2001. While I was at school, I watched the towers fall. And I remember going back to my SEAL team a couple of days after the towers fell and telling my commanding officer, hey, I know we're going to war immediately. I know that we're gonna be heading off to Afghanistan. Like I want out of this program. And he said to me, Jay, he said, this war is gonna go on for decades. Go back to that school be a leader, come back to the SEAL teams. There's still going to be stuff. There's still going to be work to do when you come back and we're going to need good leaders. So I went back to school and I focused on building myself and trying to be a better leader. Although once again, ego and arrogance were slowly creeping in. Um, I ended up being ranked number one out of the Old Dominion University ROTC, the largest ROTC consortium on the East Coast at that time. We had uh, almost 320 officer candidates and midshipmen. And I completed it ranked number one as the battalion commanding officer before I received my commission in May of 2004 and headed back to the SEAL teams. I thought I was like God's gift to leadership. I had, you know, ranked number one. I'd done all these great things in my SEAL career. And I thought I was going to come back as this amazing leader, like <clears throat> Patton incarnate, you know, that I was going to be able to go back and suddenly I was going to step into combat and I was gonna be the man and this incredible leader. So started my workup, started my training, but once again, ego and arrogance were, were creeping in. 
and I was starting to make some mistakes. There were some fundamental things that happened when I came back to the SEAL teams in May of 2004. Number one, the tactics had really changed. The last time we had been in combat for almost, um, you know, any sustained period of time was Vietnam. And any time there was erratic, um, there was erratic engagements. You had Panama, you had Grenada. Uh, SEALs did a little bit in Desert Storm, but the last time we had seen long-term sustained combat was Vietnam. And when guys stepped onto the battlefields in Iraq and Afghanistan in 2001 and 2002, they quickly realized a lot of the tactics that we had been utilizing no longer worked. So as a young SEAL leader, I stepped back knowing all these older tactics that suddenly had changed. And this is where ego and arrogance were getting the better of me, guys. I, instead of humbling myself and being able to say to the guys, hey, man, I don't know how to do this, I, can't, I continue to hang on too tight. And I was starting to mess up, which I started nursing my pain with, you know, uh, liquid uh, courage, liquid alcohol, and just continued to step on my toes, which was starting to erode my credibility as a young leader. In early 2005, uh, or I'm sorry, in, in uh, mid-2005, my, uh, my command that I was assigned to, my troop that I was assigned to, SEAL Team 10, headed off to Afghanistan. And I remember as soon as we touched on the ground, I was hungry to get involved. But right off the bat, we were hit with my first introduction to combat. Uh, so what you're looking at right there are the caskets of so many of my teammates. I'm sure there's quite a few of you that have watched the movie Lone Survivor, or you have read the book Lone Survivor by Marcus Luttrell. So I was assigned to SEAL, SEAL Team 10, three troop at that time. And three troop was comprised of two platoons, Foxtrot and Echo. Uh, I was originally a part of Echo Platoon that was led by Lieutenant Michael McGreevy, who was a friend of mine. Our boss, our troop commander, was a gentleman by the name of Lieutenant Commander Eric Christensen. If you saw the movie, Eric Christensen was played by Eric Bana in Lone Survivor. And I will never forget when we got the word that the mission that Marcus Luttrell and Michael Murphy were on um, they had been overrun by a Taliban force. Michael Murphy had laid down his life to try and save his teammates. Later, he would be posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for that action. Um, but the rest of the team, uh, Danny Dietz and Matt Axelson and Michael Murphy were killed. Marcus Luttrell became the lone survivor who was trying to evade. They launched the Quick Reaction Force, and on that Quick Reaction Force helicopter were Lieutenant Commander, my teammates, and the guys I'd worked with, Lieutenant Commander Eric Christensen, Mike McGreevy, um, Jacques Fontaine, um, Jeff Taylor, and Jeff Lucas, and uh, along with the other teammates that were on that helicopter. When that helicopter came in, it was fired upon by a Taliban force and fell out of the sky and crashed, killing all of those guys on board. So my first introduction to combat was the ramp ceremony where we had recovered the bodies and we sent all these amazing men and teammates home. I remember thinking to myself like, holy smokes, man, this is for real. And I'd love to tell you that it humbled me to where, man, like this is for real, I've gotta be a better leader. But instead, oftentimes when we were young, maybe a little immature, ego and arrogance, I wanted revenge. I wanted into the fight. And we headed off on the rest of our deployment, trying to get into different engagements, different things. And all of this came to a head in September of 2005. We were on a mission in Southern Afghanistan, operating in a really dangerous area when we got into a big firefight. My guys were down below. I was in an overwatch position and I made the decision against the wishes of my senior enlisted leader, who he and I butted heads, to go down into that valley uh, to try and take the fight to the enemy. I won't get into the details. All of this is deeply covered in my book, The Trident, but uh, it was a bad tactical call. And I'll be honest, I put myself, my machine gunner, other guys in danger making this call to go down in that valley and try and get in, involved in this gunfight. And the reason it was so dangerous is because it wasn't, I was telling myself I was doing it for the right reasons, but the reality is it was for me. I wanted in the fight. I wanted to, I saw a shortcut to look like a hero. You know, it was this GI Joe commando moment that really has no place on the battlefield. But unfortunately, um, I didn't see that at the time. And fortunately, I'm very lucky that no one was killed 
uh, were severely injured by that decision to go down into that valley. But I'll tell you what, by the time I got out to the other side, my boss, our executive officer had come in, was absolutely livid. And I might not have damaged or I might not have gotten anybody killed or injured, but what had been killed or injured was my professional reputation. And guys were already saying, get rid of that guy. He's going to get us killed. I was sent back to Bagram Air Force Base to, uh, to meet with my commanding officer and leadership. And I still was in denial, ego and arrogance walking hand in hand. And I was just like, man, I am being thrown under the bus. You know, I did the right thing. I ran to the sound of the guns. I wanted to get down into the valley to help these guys. And now, you know, they're just throwing me under the bus. And I remember getting back to Bagram and I remember heading into the room and standing at attention in front of my commanding officer and senior leaders of my team. And suddenly the, the impact of what was happening was starting to sink in because they were talking about Ensign Redmond, you know, we are heavily questioning your leadership abilities, your decision making, your tactical decision making. And it was for the first time I heard a senior member of my team say, we're thinking about taking your trident. Guys, I've already told you how difficult it is to achieve the right to wear this emblem. And when I heard those words standing in that room, I felt like I had been punched in the gut. And I was like, wait, what? And I was numb as that conversation continued until finally my commanding officer said, Ensign Redmond, why don't you go back to your room? I'm gonna discuss with the rest of the members of the team and we're gonna decide whether we take you to a Trident Review Board or what the results are gonna be. Report back here at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Guys, the Trident Review Board is the kiss of death for any SEAL. If you go before a Trident Review Board, it is a board comprised of senior leaders of a SEAL team that decide, you know, do you have the ability to continue to wear this emblem? Uh, and if they find you negative, if the results of that finding are negative, then they will take your Trident, meaning you are no longer allowed to wear it. You are stripped of the, neg the Navy designator, whether it's as an officer or as an enlisted, for being a SEAL, and they send you out to the fleet. And I remember stumbling back to my room, thinking like, how could this have happened? How, how could I have gotten to this place? Everything I ever did came back to earning this emblem and, and, and like being a good leader. And I'm thinking to myself, man, you were ranked number one out of your unit. Like, dude, you're, you're a good leader. I remember going back to my room. My room in Bagram wasn't that big. It was maybe 10 feet wide you know, maybe by seven feet across. On, on one side of the room was my bed. And uh, on the other side, it was on, on the bed. The door was kind of across from where the bed was. You know, it was kind of a long rectangular shape. Um, I actually walked in the room and I sat down in my chair that was kind of next to the end of the bed. And it was facing across my desk. And next to me was all my gear, my, my combat equipment gear, my helmet, my night vision goggles, my radios. Um, all of that was rigged and ready to go on like this wooden cross that we utilize, utilize to hang our gear on. My helmet was sitting on the top. My weapon was up above and hanging off the cross was my pistol belt. And I remember sitting there just thinking to myself, it is the end. Like it is the end. Like everything I have tried to build myself into is over. And I, I reached over into my gear and pulled out my pistol. Uh, the SEAL teams carry a six hour P226, uh, nine millimeter pistol, has a 15 round magazine. And uh, in the combat zone, we are loaded and ready to go at all times. And uh, I remember doing what's called a press check. You pull the slide back to make sure there's a bullet in the chamber, confirming there was a bullet in the chamber. And I put that gun in my mouth and I was getting ready to, to shoot myself. Um, just convinced it was the end. Um, and thankfully, I think the big man above smacked me in the back of the head and I looked across at the desk and on that desk was a picture of my amazing wife, uh, Erica, and my three kids. I had a eight-year-old son. I'm sorry, I had a, uh, at that time, he was a, um, a five-year-old son. I had a three-year-old daughter and a one-year-old daughter. 
And this voice said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I finally kind of ashamedly put my, uh, put my gun away. And I was like, I got to go get some help. I headed out into the compound, went and met with the uh, special forces chaplain. And I kind of laid this whole story on him. Like it's the end, you know, my life is over. They're going to take my trident in the morning. And, and he listened for a while. And then I finally finished and he said, okay. He said, so let me get this straight. You messed up. Something may happen, but they're not going to give you an answer till 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. And I was like, yeah, that's right. He's like, but you were going to kill yourself tonight. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, it's kind of premature, isn't it? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. He's like, why don't you wait till tomorrow morning and see what happens? He's like, but for every the end moment, I want to remind you of something. It often becomes a new beginning. He's like, why don't you keep an open mind and see what happens? So the next morning, I headed back into that room with my commanding officer. And he said, Ensign Redman, you've made some mistakes, but I believe in you. He said, you are a good leader. You have the ability to lead. He said, you're arrogant. We need to humble you. So here's what's going to happen. He said, any of the awards you were going to receive from this deployment are rescinded. You will not receive a single award for this Afghanistan deployment. Number two, he said, I'm going to write a letter of reprimand. Now, you have to understand, as an officer in the military, if you receive a letter of reprimand that goes into your permanent military record, your career is over. You will never make rank again, and it would effectively put me out of the Navy. And he said, I'm going to take this letter, and I'm going to give it to the new commanding officer. You're going to become an assistant platoon commander again. And he said, and we expect great things from you. He said, and as long as you do great, like I know you have the ability to do, he said, this letter will be shredded. It will go away. He said, if you continue with this same behavior where we question your abilities, he said, this letter will go into your permanent military record and your career will be over. Do you understand? I said, yes, sir. He said, one last thing. He said, we're going to send you to U.S. Army Ranger School. He said, Ranger Schools are leadership school. And I think it will be a good place for you to humble yourself and learn really what it is, who you are, what you're made of, and what it means to be a leader. I remember walking out of that meeting and I'd like to tell you, I thought to myself, man, I really, I really got a second chance. But, you know, oftentimes in life, it takes a little time for things to sink in. And really, those lessons didn't fully sink in until I headed to Ranger School in 2006. I headed off to Ranger School and uh, Ranger School is an amazing opportunity. It is an amazing leadership school. And as I went through leader, when as I went through that school, I finally started to take assessment of who I am. I started to really come to grips with who I am, but it wasn't before I had one final rock bottom moment. The beginning of Ranger School, um, I failed an evolution. And uh, it was an evolution that I took pride in doing, land navigation, and I failed it through, once again, ego and arrogance. Um, I was a great navigator. I'd been a point man. I'd actually taught land navigation. And once again, I thought that, you know, I was so good that I took my time on this course that was very difficult. And because of that, I did not complete it and failed it. My emotional leadership was weak at that point. You know, I'd had, you know, kind of some major adversity. And when I failed, the Rangers instructors started making fun of me. And in that moment, I snapped. And I told them where they could take this course. And they said, did you quit? Are you quitting? And I said, yes, I'm done. Screw you guys. So, of course, I had to go see the Ranger Colonel. And I remember sitting in that office with the Ranger Colonel. And I just thought, once again, the end. Like, what, what, how did this happen? Like, what are you doing? And I laid out this sob story to this Ranger Colonel and that I, you know, that I'd messed up too much. And he said, well, you know what, man? He said, I've got a really good friend, a super well-respected SEAL leader. Why don't you talk to him? And he phoned up my old commanding officer. The guy that I had gone back from ODU and asked him to put me back in the program, the guy who had said to me, Jay, we, we're going to need good leaders in the future. The guy that said this war is going to go on for decades was the guy on the other side of that phone. And the colonel handed me that phone and I laid out this sob story and told, hey, sir, you know, I've just messed up too much. The guys are never going to follow me again. I don't know how I can come back from this, this failure that I've had. And guys, he gave me the greatest piece of leadership advice. It is the foundation of everything I teach in leadership now. He said to me, Jay, people will follow you 
if you give them a reason to. He said, go back to that course, crush it, and come back to the SEAL teams and give the guys a reason to follow you like I know you have the ability to do. <laughs> I couldn't say no. I uh, handed the phone back to the Ranger Colonel and I said, all right, sir, can I get back in my class? And the Ranger Colonel said, absolutely not. He said, you stop this class, so guess what? You're gonna go sit in Ranger School Jail for the next month. He said, in Ranger School Jail, why don't you think about what it is to be in a leader, who you are, all these different things. And for the next month, I walked around Fort Pickett, Fort, or sorry, Fort Benning, Georgia, picking up trash with a little pokey stick and a trash bag. And I tell you what, guys, you talk about a humbling experience to go from a, you know, a, a SEAL, a combat SEAL, a leader, a guy who had been number one in my ROTC class, walking around base, picking up trash, and for a short period of time, thinking I was too good to pick up trash, finally humbled myself and said, you know what, man, you're not as great a leader as you think you are. You know, you have been placing yourself in the number one position all this time. And the reality is, if you want to be an effective leader in this life and your company, you place the company or the mission first, your people become second, and you are last in the equation. And I began to realize that I had that all backwards. So as I finally figured out who I was, I came to grips with how I needed to lead myself. That number one, I needed to lead myself. I needed to create structure and discipline. The rank, the title, these badges you wear, none of them matter. All that matters is how you lead yourself, how you set the example for the things you do in your life. Because if you do that, it is the essence of what Vince Peterson said. People will follow you if you give them a reason to. Number two, lead others. I started focus on how do I lead others? How do I build relationships with these individuals? How do I learn to trust and rely on them for the amazing things they do and reward them and give them opportunities? Also providing the right and left limits. And then the last one, guys, how do you lead always? Regardless of the situation, whether you're out drinking or whether, whether you're at an office party or whether you're out at Target or whether you're in the office, or leading or on the battlefield, you have to lead always. Leadership is not a switch that you can turn on and off. And I realized those three things, and as I headed back to my SEAL team, that's what I focused on. I gotta tell you, it was not easy. Those next two years are probably the longest and hardest road I ever walked. Because I will tell you what, when I came back to my SEAL team, the guys weren't waiting with open arms saying, oh, you graduated Ranger School, you must be a new guy, no. The new assault troop that I entered saw me as a pariah. They were like, you're that dude that messed up in Afghanistan. You're that dude that made that bad call. We don't want to work with you. I felt like I felt like Forrest Gump when he was a kid and he got on the bus and you know, you go sit down and people were like, seats taken. And uh, every day I had to go back to my three rules of leadership. All right, man, you focus on leading yourself. You focus on showing up with positivity uh, uh, and, you know, all your gear set, you're here early, you're on time, you're making things happen, you're focused on the next evolution and slowly evolution by evolution by evolution over the next year and a half, I built back my professional reputation, my credibility, the respect, the respect and trust I needed for my teammates to allow me, allow me to lead them. Early in 2007, we were selected to be the uh, troop that was going to operate in the Ambar province of Iraq, Iraq, and I was getting ready to head off uh, for this amazing deployment. And guys, I got to tell you, as a SEAL, your abilities, your reputation is forged on the battlefield. And I knew that it was the final crucible. Even though I had done a good job in training, even though I had built back that respect and credibility, I knew that the final hurdle I had to overcome was going back into combat, making good decisions, showing my teammates that mission men and I had placed myself last on the equation. So we arrived into Iraq in early 2007 and stepped into an absolute uh, civil war in Iraq. Um, it was during a time called the Ambar Awakening, and we were going out on missions virtually every night, getting into firefights every night, uh, but making but I was making good decisions. I was following you know, the, the, the standard operating procedures that we had set and slowly over time and in some pretty big hairy engagements uh, really was starting to earn back 
that credibility and was getting my career back on track. Fast forward to the end. Um, fast forward to June of 2007, and my team and I got into a huge uh, gunfight. Um, we were taking down a three structure uh, target building, kind of a compound. And we had broken up into three assault teams. I was leading one of the assault teams for building number two. And uh, as we were getting ready to make entry into the building, we were walking by the courtyard and there was 11 women and children that were sleeping in the courtyard. We grabbed a couple of our Iraqi scouts and one of my SEALs and I said, grab these women and children, pull them into the house. And right as we did that, all of a sudden the world exploded. We had, uh, we had enemy fighters on the roof dropping grenades down on us. We started taking fire from multiple positions around the house. Uh, immediately, several of my guys and our interpreter were badly fragged with uh, fragmentation from grenades. We pulled in, one of our guys tried to get up, uh, or a couple of our guys tried to get up on the upper deck and uh, was immediately shot in the chest. Thankfully, his body armor saved it, but recognized that there were multiple enemy fighters, including an enemy fighter that was barricaded on the roof with a machine gun shooting at our other, um, our other teams in the other two buildings. Uh, uh, it was a chaotic situation, and I remember working on it and, and running around the building trying to navigate how we were doing this, protect these women and children, take care of our wounded, calling in close air support. And finally, at one point, I told the guys, look, we can't stay in this house. We've got to fall back to another one. But oh, by the way, we've got to move all of these women and children with us. So I said, everybody grab a woman and child, ranging from an 80-year-old woman all the way down to about a six-month-old baby. And as SEALs, we protected these women and children as we did a complex fire, you know, shooting and moving um, maneuver, getting us back to another house before we called in an airstrike from an AC-130 gunship taking out the enemy in that house. When we got back from that mission, it was like everything had changed. The guys were like, Red, you did it. They're like, bro, right on. And I knew for the first time I had come full circle. Like I had earned back the right to wear this emblem. And uh, from that point forward, for the rest of the deployment, my career was back on track. I had been selected. Uh, by the time we were getting ready to go home in early September, I'd been selected for my next level of leadership. I had been allowed to screen for our next tier SEAL team, which is a huge deal. You only, only the top of the top are allowed to even screen for that team. And uh, I was just like, man, everything is back on point. One week before going home on September 13, 2007, we were told that the number one leader for the Al-Qaeda organization for the Anbar province of Iraq was in a specific location, not far from where that big gunfight that I just described to you, in a place called Karma, Iraq. And I remember gearing up for that mission. I was told I was going to be the assault force commander, meaning I was the leader in charge of the actual target takedown. And we knew that this enemy leader traveled with heavy, um, a very well-trained security detail, his security detail all wore suicide vests. If we got too close, they would blow themselves up to, um, to take us out. And I remember flying into that target, thinking about the complexities, trying to play through all these different scenarios and just all this stress in our bodies as we prepared to go in on this target that we knew we were gonna encounter heavy resistance. And I remember when the helicopters landed and we made entry into this building, fully expecting to get shot, all of a sudden it was like, Nothing happened. As often happens in life and in battle, sometimes the information you get is dated or wrong. And although we found a whole lot of activity that somebody had been there, and we even found explosives and IED making components, no one was there. So we thought it was going to be a quiet night. It was about 2 a.m. in the morning and at this point. My team and I were just sitting on the porch waiting for our explosive ordnance guys to finish wrapping things up. They were going to blow all this, uh, all this. IED equipment in place, and then we were going to call it a night. It was going to be an early night, and that was going to be it. When suddenly my boss came up to me and said, "Hey, Red, we got a whole we got a whole bunch of activity on another target. Uh, we're watching. We just saw five guys come out of this house about 150 yards away. They ran across the street into some vegetation, and they're hiding over there. We want you to take uh, some of your team. Let's walk these guys down. Let's wrap them up. Let's find out what they know." 
And I remember taking my team and starting to move through that vegetation. Guys, to make a long story short, that five-man detail was the last part of the security detail for this number one Al Qaeda leader. He had been in the house we were in, where we found all the where we found all the IED making equipment, and he had moved to that hall, house 150 yards away to sleep for the night. His team had seen that there was a road that crossed in between this this wood line and the house, and there was a big open field to the side of the house. So they thought we would either come in by vehicles or we would land a helicopter to try and get him. And they set up an ambush line across the street. And unbeknownst to us, we walked right into that ambush line. My team and I were initially shot. My medic was initially shot right below the knee, severed both bones and anchored him to the ground. One of our other guys ran forward to grab our medic and start to drag him back. He was shot up the body three times. They managed to pull back to behind us was about a was a tractor, like a large John Deere style tractor uh, tire, which was about 15 yards behind me, maybe one tree off to the side. But other than that, it was thousands of yards of empty Iraqi desert. And I remember trying to lay down fire as all this gunfire erupted. Two PKM machine guns that shoot a bullet about the size of my thumb. Uh, all of us were getting crisscrossed with bullets. I was shot eight times between the body and body armor, two rounds in the left elbow, rounds off my helmet, rounds off my gun, rounds off my right side plate. Um, I tried to turn and move back to where the guys were, and I caught a round in the face. It hit me right in front of the ear, traveled through my face, exited the right side of my nose, blew off almost all of my nose, uh, blew out most of my cheekbone. What was left of my cheekbone broke and kicked out to the right, vaporized my orbital floor, broke all the bones above my eye, broke the head of my jaw, shattered my jaw to my chin, and it knocked me out. Roughly about 12 hours later, I found myself laying in a bed in, uh, in Baghdad. And my commanding officer were there and our command master chief. And I remember laying in this bed, thankful I'm still alive, to be perfectly honest. And then all those years, training, the lessons, mission, man, me, I started thinking. And I went to talk and I could not talk. And the nurse said to me, Lieutenant Redmond, you've been shot in the face. You've got massive damage to your face. You're wired shut and you are trached. You're not gonna be able to talk. And I said, okay, give me a pen. She brought me a pen and a paper. And I wrote to my commanding officer, are the guys okay? And they said to me that our two guys that had been wounded were okay. They were out of surgery and they were stable. And they said, everybody else was okay. I said, okay. I said, has my wife been notified? My CEO said, yes, I talked to her myself. She knows you're in surgery uh, and that you have just got or that you're getting ready to come out. He said, I'll call her again and update her, you know, that you're OK. I said, OK. I said, do I still look pretty? And uh, of course, they laughed and they said, no, you're an ugly son of a bitch. You know, getting shot in the face is probably the best thing that will ever happen to you. And guys, I won't lie. Um, reality was starting to set in. Uh, the next day. They moved me to Balad, uh, Iraq, where they treat head injuries, and they were starting to prep me for the long flight home. And I remember sitting in the ICU, thinking about the future, thinking about that I had no use of my left arm, I had no use of my hand, uh, I'm, I'm, my face is broken and disfigured, and I'm thinking to myself, where do I go from here? Um, there was also this major fear that was starting to creep in as I prepped to get placed on the medevac flight to fly back across the Atlantic Ocean to Bethesda, Maryland, where I knew I would see my wife. And you see, there's some interesting statistics. In the SEAL teams, we have a 90% divorce rate. It is a very hard career on families. We even even when we're not deployed, we are rarely ever home. We train all across the country and around the world. So typically it is not unusual for a SEAL during training, let alone uh, deployment to be gone 300 days out of the year. So it leaves wives and, and, and family members to have to raise families by themselves, to deal with broken appliances and purchasing cars and raising kids alone. I knew those statistics. Even though I had a, a strong marriage and amazing wife, I thought about this. And you see, there was another fact that came about. Wounded warriors have about a 
divorce rate. And guys, I kicked down all these doors. I had overcome these major things in my life. But the greatest fear I have ever felt was on that flight home, thinking about this. Because I had heard stories of disfigured wounded warriors, wounded warriors who were disfigured, who were burned, who were maimed, laying in their hospital beds in Bethesda, where I was heading. And wives or girlfriends would come in and take off their wedding ring, set it on the end of the bed and walk out. And my greatest fear was how my wife was going to handle this. I felt like a monster. I had not looked at myself in a mirror. I knew I had tubes coming out of virtually every orifice. I was too weak to get up, you know, from the blood loss. I couldn't even use my arm. All I could think about was my military, my special operations career is over. I'm going to be permanently disfigured and I'm going to be forever disabled. We landed in Bethesda and they wheeled me off that plane and brought me up to my room in the hospital. And I remember laying there as the nurse came in and said, hey, your wife is outside the room. Do you want me to let her in? And this fear gripped me. Um, and I was like, no, uh, I'm not ready. And I, I wrote to her and I, I, and I said, I'm not ready. And the nurse said, okay. She's like, but I really think your wife is anxious to get in here. And guys, I was so afraid. I was so afraid of what she was going to say. I was afraid. Was she going to come into that room and be shocked to be disgusted with what she saw? Guys, I got to tell you, man, my wife is amazing. Because when she came into that room, she and Bad and I, she, uh, <laughs> she walked straight up. She pushed these tubes out of her way. She kissed me on the lips and she said, we're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. Whoo, man. Guys, who you let into your inner circle, who you have on that inner ring of influence as a team member is such a powerful thing, man. And I, and I am a little ashamed that I, I doubted our relationship and our wife, my wife, but man, she showed me and she became the strength that I needed in that moment. I knew we were gonna be okay. A couple of days later, as we were navigating this journey, this super overwhelming journey that they were telling us, it was gonna be years to put me back together, the amount of facial damage I had, trying to figure out how to reconfigure my face. They were talking about potentially amputating my arm. We were inundated with a lot of negativity. And at one point, there were some individuals that had come into the room and they started to have a conversation about what a shame. What a pity. We send these young men and women off to war and they're, and, and, you know, they're never going to be the same. They're just going to be broken and battered. They're never going to be able to achieve success. You see, my wife had left the room at that point. She had gone to get a cup of coffee or something. And I remember when the doctors and nurses left and when those individuals left, I remember sitting in that bed thinking to myself, is this, is this it? Like, is this my future? Am I just going to be this broken individual? Am I going to be the, you know, Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump, you know, the drunk Lieutenant Dan, not that you've got new legs, Lieutenant Dan. Um, and it was in that moment, guys, that I thought back on this journey that I had been through. I thought about that leadership failure. I thought about climbing out of that deep, dark hole. And I told myself, no, I will not be a victim. In this life, so many people want to place you into the victim box because of something that happened to you. In this life, it's becoming, you know, we want to place you in the victim box because of your race, creed, color, gender, religion, gender persuasion. I don't care what it is. Others want to place you in the victim box. And it's just not true. It is a lie. It is a lie. Because you see, the greatest gift you have in this life, you have a choice. You have a choice in how you're going to deal with adversity. You have a choice. The only thing stopping you from accomplishing greatness in this life is you. And as I lay in that hospital bed and my wife came back in, I said, never again. Never again is somebody going to come into this room feeling sorry for the wounds that I've sustained. Never again. Never again. I refuse to have pity for myself and I will not let anybody else have pity for me. And it was in that moment I wrote out this sign that said, attention to all who enter here. If you're coming into this room with sadness or sorrow, don't bother. The wounds that I receive, I got in a job that I love, doing it for people that I love, defending the freedom of a country that I deeply love. I will make a full recovery. 
What is full? That's the absolute utmost physically. I have the ability to recover. And then I'm going to push that about 20% further through sheer mental tenacity. This room you're about to enter is a room of fun, optimism, and intense rapid recall. If you are not prepared for that, go elsewhere. And we signed it, the manager. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I still look back at that and kind of laugh like, you know, uh, hey, babe, do you think this has enough credibility? Should we, you know, maybe we add the management to make it more credible. Um, but we signed it to management. And I told her, put it on the door. No one else allowed into this room until they read it. A couple of days later, a SEAL teammate was visiting. And as he left the room, he looked at the sign one more time. And he took his trident off the uniform and he tacked it into the bottom of the sign at the bottom of the door. And I remember seeing that moment and thinking, wow, I have come full circle. I am a young kid who believes so strongly in that emblem, who almost lost that emblem, and now has earned back the respect of my teammates because this sign and everything it represents is all about the overcome mindset. It is the essence of what it is to be a SEAL, but it is not a SEAL trait, guys. It is a human trait. It is a choice to choose positivity in the face of negativity that sign ended up going viral. It went all over the place. It was on all the national news networks. Since that sign has been hung, um, it has been written about by, um, Secretary Robert Gates wrote about it in his book. First Lady Michelle Obama wrote about it, not once, but twice in her book. I don't tell you that to say, look at me, I'm this guy that wrote the sign. I tell you that because that is the power of choice. It is the power of choosing positivity in the face of negativity. President Bush heard about the sign on the door, and I was invited to the White House to meet him because of that sign. And I got to tell you, what an amazing experience. I don't get starstruck much. I've met a lot of famous people at this point in my life. But to be invited to the White House, into the Oval Office, with the most powerful man in the world, was absolutely amazing. And uh, before we got ready to go, I told my son, buddy, we're going to go to the White House and we're going to meet the president of the United States. I said, you need to learn how to meet a man and, you know, you how you shake hands with someone. you got to look him in the eye. And for months I worked on it. I, everyone we'd meet, I'd be like, hey, go shake his hand. Go shake his hand. So, guys, right after we walked in the door and met President Bush, this was the picture they sent back after the trip. And I got to tell you, as a dad, I cannot have been more proud as I saw this picture of my son, I mean, look at that handshake, man. It's so good. Like eye contact, good grip. But uh, I got to tell you, President Bush was absolutely amazing. He spent 35 minutes in the Oval Office with us. We talked everything about the financial crisis, which was occurring in the fall of 2008. One of my, um, my, my um, executive officer for my SEAL team was a White House fellow came and joined us in the room and told him about the night we saved the women and children. Uh, and it was just amazing. There were a couple other funny moments that happened when we were in the Oval Office. My, uh, my middle daughter, who at that time was five, is by far our most precocious child, and she is the most like me. And uh, they were given these little goodie bags, and you guys can see this goodie bag that my, my oldest daughter is laying out all her items on the floor. And first off, I remember looking like, oh my God, she just dumped her goodie bag out all over the presidential seal. Like, oh my God, like my career's over. President Bush just kind of laughed and he said, yeah, my daughter's used to play in here when my dad was in the office. So brought things down. But in those bags was the, uh, the White House M&Ms. There was the different, um, different items and different things about the White House and government, pictures of the president's dog and stuff like that. But there was a little kaleidoscope in the bag. And if you look to the right of the picture, my youngest daughter actually has the kaleidoscope right there next to my wife. Well, my older daughter did not have a kaleidoscope in her bag. And uh, she didn't say a word. Like, you would think she'd be like, hey, mom and dad, I didn't have a kaleidoscope. But no, this sassy little kid, man, looked around that room and was like, okay, I don't have a kaleidoscope. Who can get me a kaleidoscope? Mom, dad, grandma, that, that, President's aide, dude, that other officer, uh, the photographer, no. Most powerful man in the free world, that dude can get me a kaleidoscope. So she waited right to the very end. As we were getting ready to leave, we know, hey, the president has to go. We were going to walk with him out to the Rose Garden where he was going to fly away. Um, 
or, or to the south lawn where he was going to fly away on the helicopter. And, uh, and my daughter walked straight up to President Bush. I mean, if she was any closer, she would have been standing on his toes. And she held this bag up and said, Mr. President, I don't have a kaleidoscope in my bag. And uh, oh my God, I thought like, <laughs> what just happened here? And President Bush, without missing a beat, was like, well, we will fix that immediately. I half expected ninjas to drop out of the ceiling with kaleidoscopes. Needless to say, my daughter got her kaleidoscope. The other thing that happened is I brought the sign on the door. Guys, I didn't feel like it was mine. I didn't feel like I could keep it. And I asked President Bush to sign it. And we then had it framed in an amazing frame with all the service emblems and the Afghanistan and Iraq service medal on the Purple Heart at the top to honor those who had been wounded in combat. All those individuals who would be coming through Bethesda and later Walter Reed. To this day, that sign still hangs in Walter Reed in the middle of the wounded board. I can't tell you how many individuals have told me what an impact that sign has had on them. The wood at the bottom of the sign is rubbed bare because wounded warriors go by and touch it for luck before surgery. This is the power of choice. This is the power of choosing positivity in the face of negativity. I spent another five years in the military. I was never operational again. I tried to get back operational, but unfortunately uh, my arm, I can't bend any further than this. I can't extend any further than that. So it stopped me from ever being able to be an operational SEAL again. But the Navy took good care of me and I was able to work in different, I worked in training, I worked in operations, I worked special projects. But I started to come to grips with my military career was coming to an end. Shortly before my retirement in 2013, I headed back to SEAL training. And I got to, as you can see, these two pictures, that picture of that young knucklehead kid and this picture of me many years later standing on the compound where these younger SEALs were going through. When I was out there, I was thinking about this career. I was thinking about the Trident and how it had changed and evolved from my view, from that very romantic, you know, young, immature view to the different view that I had of this emblem at the end of my career. You see, the Navy SEAL emblem is a very unique emblem in the Department of Defense. It's an amazing emblem. You know, the eagle represents American might. The anchor represents the U.S. Navy. The eagle's outstretched wings represent our ability to come in from the air. That trident that it clutches in its hands indicates our ability to come from the sea. And the cocked flintlock pistol represents our ability to come from the land. And when I was a kid, all I saw was like this awesomeness and this warrior spirit and, you know, all these things. The one thing I missed that I didn't understand, and I probably couldn't have understood when I was a young man, was that the Navy SEAL emblem is the only emblem in the entire Department of Defense, and I believe in the entire United States government, where the eagle has its head down. You see eagle and any other emblem of the United States or within the Department of Defense, the eagle holds its head high, proud. The seal emblem, our founders, when they created it, had the mindset that there's going to be a lot of sacrifice that occurs in our community. And this eagle humbly understands the sacrifice. You see, over my military career, I have been to over 50 funerals and memorials. This picture is a picture of a friend of mine, Chief Adam Brown. There's an amazing book about Adam's story that is currently being made into a movie called Fearless. But sometime in the beginning of the war, at one of our funerals, rumor is it was Mike Monsoor's funeral who would earn the Medal of Honor. A SEAL took his trident off and tacked it into the wood of the casket. And from that point for forward, every SEAL funeral there has been we take our tridents off and we tack them into the casket to honor our brothers lost and cover the entire out of casket and gold with the emblem that we all work so hard to achieve and that so many sacrifice for. And at the end of my career, I came to understand that this emblem represents sacrifice. It represents selfless leadership. It represents mission, men, and yourself last in the equation. So we come full circle. Guys, here are the takeaways. 
freedom is not free. From the very beginning of this country, there have been amazing men and women who stepped up and said, hey, I believe in the greatness of this country and I believe in freedom. I feel like right now in our nation, we are eroding some of the freedoms that are out there. And there are some people, whether they just choose to ignore it, um, I just look around me and people have begun to take freedom for granted. Freedom must be nurtured. It must be nurtured. In the worst of times, it must be fought for. And there are hundreds of thousands of Americans who have laid down their life, millions of Americans who have laid down their life for the freedom of our country. I almost did it. I have friends that have done it. So I ask you that you do not take this freedom for granted. It's worth fighting for. We need to hang on to it. Number two, it is never too late. I don't care what failure or setback you've had in this life. It's never too late to come back. People will follow you if you give them a reason to. Oftentimes I talk about in other talks about being on the X and the X is the point of attack, the point of the crisis. It's the point of adversity. It's never too late to get off the X. It is a mindset. It comes on you, but it's never too late. That is a lie that we tell ourselves. We may not be able to bring back the world that we thought. I was never able to be a SEAL operator again, but instead a the end moment became a new beginning and you can do the same. Number three, there are no shortcuts in this life. I tried to take a shortcut as a young leader, and uh, boy, it almost ended my career. Leadership, success, it's achieved by grinding. It's achieved by experience. It's achieved through the highs and lows. So don't look for the shortcuts. Embrace the journey, man. That's where we're going to learn those things along the way. The good times, the bad times, the successes and the failures. That's where we become great leaders. And last, guys, you have a choice. You have a choice. Nobody forces you to lay on that X and feel sorry for yourself. In this day and age where being a victim is common, I, I feel like people are trying to out-victim each other. Don't be a victim. Be a victor. Greatness lies within you. Success lies within you. Bad things are going to happen to good people. Don't be a victim, be a victor. Get up, get off that X and drive forward. It is the key to my success in this life. And I know it can be the key to success in your life. I am fortunate enough to have written three books. Uh, the Trident is the basically the story that we just covered. Obviously, there's a lot more detail in it. Went on to be a New York Times bestseller. Overcome is the how-to. So many people hear my story and they say, how did you do that? Overcome gives you a step-by-step -step process on how to get off the X, how to lead yourself, how to lead others, and how to lead always. And then we recently released my Point Man Planner, which teaches you how to define your mission in this life and create structure and discipline to accomplish your goals. I have two online courses, the Overcome Mindset and 72 Hours to Peak Performance. And we also have the amazing uh, No Bad Days collection. Uh, that skull is my skull. Uh, the bullet hole up in my forehead, <laughs> that was actually in my helmet. Thankfully, it was not in my forehead. But my buddy, who was an artist, drew it. The damage to the side is actually the actual damage that was drawn directly off my CT scan. I look at that picture, and every day I wake up, I am thankful that I am still here, that I am still breathing the free air. And I tell myself there are no bad days. There are hard days. There are tough days. But if you wake up breathing air, it's a good day. It's up to you to make it a great day. So we created the no, bad days, the no Bad Days line to encourage people to understand that perspective that when you encounter adversity, see it as an opportunity, not as negative. So guys, that is my presentation. If you're interested in joining my mailing list, I put out great content on leadership, on resilience, on how to overcome adversity, how to be a better leader, how to be a better version of you. Uh, you can take a picture of that emblem and it'll uh, allow you to sign up for our mailing list and you can get these two handouts. Uh, two of the big things that I teach companies and individuals to react methodology, which is how you get off the X and learn to lead how you can be a more effective leader. So I want to say thank you and uh, I'm going to open it up for questions.